Greetings from Pastors Network International. This is your friend and pastor, Bishop George Mulinge, and I am so, so excited that we can be able to connect once again. I would like to welcome you to our second part in the series that we just began on the biblical picture of marriage. Attention is called to the book of Genesis, and today we'll be reading verses number 26 to 28 of the book of Genesis and going forward. So let's begin by looking at that particular portion of scripture. Then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse number 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In our last episode, we discovered when God set up the heavens and the earth in that order, the heavens first, then the earth, God put a guardian angel, a guardian uh, or a ruling cherub known as Satan, Lucifer. And at some point, that guardian angel or that uh, ruling cherub that had been given charge over this one part of God's universal kingdom, a time came when that particular creature sinned against God. And when he sinned against God, the Bible says that led to the destruction of the earth and the entire portion of his domain or the region that God had given him to rule and exercise authority. And this necessitated that God initiate a process of restoration that lasted for a period of six days and towards the end of the sixth day, God decided to create an entirely new being to replace that fallen creature or that rebellious Satan that sinned against God's authority. And therefore, man was created in God's image and God's likeness towards the end of the sixth day. And when all the works were finished, we learn from the scriptures that God rested from all his work and sanctified the seventh day. He called the seventh day the day of rest, the holy day, because God had rested from all his works. Just looking at that which we have read from Genesis 1, 26 to 27, I'd like us to discuss four things today, and we will continue from there. The first one is that we have identified from scripture that this man, that is created in the image and likeness of God, was created to exercise dominion. That is the first thing. He is created for purposes of rulership, for purposes of exercising authority. In other words, he was created to rule in the stead of the rejected ruler, that is Satan. And this is to happen within the restored scope or within the restored creation, that is the earth. And therefore, man has to take dominion and has to rule from the heavens above over the earth over this particular creation that God had placed under the rulership of Satan. And therefore, it's important for us to realize that when God announced in that verse, number 26, there are two things Three, uh, three factors, actually, that are very important in that announcement that God said. Because you would wonder, why did God have to say? Why did God have to announce it? I want to believe that God announced this particular statement. Let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness and let them have dominion. God announced that, number one, that Satan himself may hear that he is going to be replaced, that God had now come to the end of uh, the rulership of a guardian angel. And there was not going to be any other choice other than replacing Satan. So he spoke it in the hearing of Satan himself. Number two, God announced that 
so that the man that had been created in his own image and his likeness may come to this understanding that God had made an announcement, a public announcement, that he was creating him in the image and likeness of himself. And then thirdly, God announced this so that the successive generations can come to an understanding of what God had intended to do. It was a time for a regime change. It was a time for a reorganization of the rulership of the earth from the heavens above. And therefore God made it clear by this announcement. This is really very interesting and very important for us because matters having to do with dominion over the three realms of God's kingdom, that is over the heavens, the earth and underwater. This is not a simple matter. It's quite a great scope in God's economy. And therefore, we find the second thing that brings our attention in this matter is that man did not automatically ascend to that position of dominion. God created him and created him to exercise dominion. But our second point states very clearly that he did not or he was not supposed to ascend to that place of dominion automatically. In other words, God placed him under some instruction or some condition. And one of the reasons that we find in scripture why God did not allow that, it's complimented for us in the book of Hebrews, chapter number two, verse number seven, is because at that point in time, man had been created a little lower than the angels. And God set up the angels and gave them the entire authority over the universe. He placed them a place higher than man. And therefore, man is now created a little lower than the angels. And this can only fit together, this change can only fit together in God's timing or in God's plan. Hebrews 2, 7, you have made man a little lower than the angels. So he was made a little lower than the angels. And you can imagine that God is lifting up man to rule in a place higher above the angels. So something must happen for this change to take course. The angels come down and man assumed that place I a place of authority. And we understand very well even today as the scripture says that angels have been placed by God to be ministering spirits to those who will inherit salvation. Now the third thing that we find in that particular scripture is that man to qualify to exercise that dominion he needed to be proven worthy. That is the third thing. He needed to be proven worthy. In other words, God had to test him. You know, he had to put him into a credibility test, whether he would actually be able to, to meet the standards or to keep God's standards of faithful obedience to that which God has said. And having been done, I would like you to know that God did not only seek to do this to just have man rule or test man for nothing. God wanted this man to fit in his perfect plan. You know, it's one thing to be created by God and to be placed in a place of God's purpose. But being in the will of God is the most important thing. So man had to perfectly be found in God's will and not just accomplishing a task of his own. Praise the name of the Lord. And then fourthly, and this is what we're going to finish with, God ordained that this man would not rule alone. He had to have a bride. Now, think about it. The previous arrangement of rulership had to do with angels. That is, Satan and a contingent of other angels subject to him. The whole world today, and uh, even then, you know, was subjected to the rulership of angels. And angels are invisible, they are greater, they are bigger than humans. God set them up in the universe in that order. And therefore, what we realize is that God had announced that this time round is not going to be an arrangement of rulership of angels. It's going to be man and a bride by side. So the man could not rule without a bride in this new order of rulership. So God made it that this man for him to qualify to exercise that dominion over the, the, the birds of the air 
the animals of the land and the fish of the sea, he must have a bride by his side. And what that means is that God now in this new order of rulership is that man will rule as a king and the woman by his side as a consort queen. And this is what we're talking about, picture of marriage. You can imagine from the beginning God ordained that the man will have in matters having to do with rulership must have a wife by his side as a companion, as a helpmate or one to stand by his side to help him in this responsibility of exercising dominion and authority. That we will find as I bring this to a close in Genesis 2.18 where God himself said it is not good for the man to be alone in this dominion thing. He must have a bride, he must have a wife so that he can qualify to rule. And it's important for us to realize matters having to do with the man and the woman in a marriage arrangement began from this point where God saw it is not good for the man to be alone. And I want to believe that, you know, the status quo remains, that God even today sees that it's not good for the man to be alone. That's why there is joy when a son gets married, gets married to the parents. I mean, the parents are overjoyed because the son has become a man. He has fulfilled God's will that it's not good for the man to be alone. It's good when a minister of God has a wife. It's good when God's servants have a wife because it's not good for the man to be alone. As a matter of fact, when God sees that marriage arrangement within a man and his wife, and as they follow the scriptures, it sends a picture of a picture of God's intentions in matters having to do with rulership. And this picture is not only seen in our marriages today, it's also seen towards the end of what we find in the book of prophecy in the wedding. The man having a bride and the man saying, let the bride come. I have to put it to an end here. We will continue from.